Hello, I'm Alan Arkish, and this is Trailers from Hell. I think we can all agree that Billy Wilder is one of the greatest writer-directors of all times. But, like us mortals, once in a while, he would get stuck on a line of dialogue or on a scene. And when that would happen, he'd pour himself a cup of Viennese coffee, turn to his writing partner, and say, How would Lubitsch do it? Ernst Lubitsch, in the golden age of Hollywood, he was the peak the top, beyond category. He started off as an actor, and in 1914, he directed his first movie. In 1919, he was brought to the United States by no one less than Charlie Chaplin, and the triumphs ensued. Movies like The Marriage Circle, Trouble in Paradise, one of my personal favorites, Designed for Living, Nanachka, Heaven Can Wait, and perhaps his funniest movie because it has the most serious intent, To Be or Not to Be. If you're a film buff, you quote that movie all the time. They all have sophistication, polished nonchalance, and audacious sexual nuance. In other words, the Lubitsch touch. Our Trailer from Hell is the movie that he felt was his best and his family felt was most like him. It contains the type of people that were his friends and that he loved. From 1940, a movie that I love, The Shop Around the Corner. Well, they don't make trailers like this anymore because they don't make movies like this anymore. I love that you get to meet all the characters and at the end of the trailer, the real star of the show. Oh, there you are. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to introduce myself. I, uh, I am Mr. Matuchek of Matuchek and Company, the shop around the corner. Lubitsch bought the rights to the play Parfumerie, and with his favorite writer, Samson Rafelson, they shaped it into a tribute to his father's clothing store in Berlin. Naturally, he drew upon his personal experiences working there. It's the final flourishing of his genius, character and story intermingled with poignance and vulnerability. At its heart, it's a love story about a couple too much in love with love to fall tidily into each other's arms. He held off production until James Stewart and Margaret Sullivan were available. They had known each other since their early days in Summerstock, and Stewart said working with Sullivan was one of the joys of his First, life. I'd like you to get acquainted with my head salesman, Mr. Kralik, played by James Stewart. Yeah, I can buy two dozen of these cigarette boxes at Miklos Brothers. What do you think of it? I think it's great. Well, open it. No, Mr. Matichek, it's not for us. But you haven't listened to it. It plays O.G. Chornia. Even if it played Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, I'd still say no. No, I, I just don't like the idea. It's a brilliant script that, in the words of David Thompson, is something fit for Shakespeare or Mozart. The head and the heart fall in love at different speeds. Listen, I sold as much goods yesterday as anybody else in the shop. 95 Pengo 50 isn't bad for a rainy Monday three weeks before Christmas. Did you tell that to Mr. Matichek? Yes, I did. And what did he say? He said, tell her not to come in that blouse anymore. Tell him I won't. I will. Now, I want you to take a look at Mr. Perovich. The rest of the cast is packed with the director's stock company. Actors like Felix Brassart, who didn't mind that Lubitsch acted out the way he wanted them to exactly play their parts. Perovich, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? No, no, go ahead. Well, it's very confidential. Yeah, sure. Well, I suppose a fellow like me wants to get married. Well, that's wonderful. That's the best thing that could happen to you. Where's the girl? Oh, wait a minute. What did I say? I said, suppose. I said, a fellow like me, I did say me. Now, look, how much does it cost you to live? Uh, you and Mrs. Pirovich are leaving out the children. Oh, why fool yourself? And now... I have a real treat for you. So what is the Lubitsch touch? Andrew Saris thinks it's the counterpoint of poignant sadness during a film's gayest moment. Or is it oblique dialogue which says everything through metaphor and indirection? He seems to make the audience an accomplice in the director's knowingness. In any case, you know it when you see it in the faces of Stuart and Sullivan. It's a comedy that is so good it frightens us for them. Their inevitable cafe scene is one of the best meetings in any movie. Here's the setup. So now you go to see your girlfriend. By the way, is it serious? Yes, very. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe we'll both be engaged Monday. I think we will. Uh, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I just said in my case it might happen. Well, as a matter of fact, I can tell you it will happen. Ah, uh, oh, <laughs> I thought you were a customer. <laughs> I should have known better. <laughs> However, every disappointment has its bright side. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to meet Ernst Lubitsch, our director. Uh, 
the man who gave you a garbo in the Notchka who made you laugh and who now gives you a Morgan who makes you laugh. I hope. Yes, I hope so too, in the shop around the corner. And with that, let's go back to Billy Wilder. At Lubitsch's funeral, he and his close friend William Wyler were trying to come to terms with their loss. Sadly, Billy Wilder said, no more Lubitsch, to which William Wyler replied, even worse, no more Lubitsch movies. Is that still rolling? Mm -hmm. Okay, I, this I couldn't fit in, but I wanted to tell you. So I'm reading about his life in this book, and when he did Heaven Can Wait, he had a huge heart attack at the end of this. And basically his doctor came to him and said, you can't eat all this rich food. Now, he was going, having meals made to him and going out to eat. He was everyone's favorite dinner person. Marlena Dietrich would cook for him. I mean, can you imagine? And he had a lot of sex. He always had a mistress. And the doctor says to him, okay, here's a diet you have to go on. No more rich foods and no more sex and you'll, or very little, and you live to be 100. Which Lubitsch replies, with a diet like that, if I live to be 100, you just bury me anyway. So he continues to work and he kept having these heart attacks, which is why in the later years he has these producer credits. He would start the movie and he couldn't finish. And then he did Clooney Brown and he had another really bad heart attack after that. And they told him that he couldn't basically work anymore. So that was like 45 or so. And in 47, they give him an honorary Academy Award because he's been nominated twice. So he goes up to get the award, and in front of everyone, while we hand him the award, he has an angina attack, which he describes to his biographer as he had this attack, and he said, I gave the greatest performance of my life, Lubitsch being happy. And afterwards, all these people came up to him and congratulated him and everything, and he acted like everything was great, like it was charming. And when it was over, he said, get me to the hospital, and they took him to the hospital, and he died five months later. I don't know what the moral is, but <laughs> <laughs> Lubitsch was his own greatest invention.